This is the unbroken seal of Tutankhamun's tomb, having been untouched for 3,245 years. During the early 20th century, Howard Carter, a British Egyptologist, excavated for many years in the Valley of the Kings, a royal burial ground located on the west bank of the ancient city of Thebes, Egypt. When Carter arrived in Egypt in 1891, he became convinced there was at least one undiscovered tomb, that of the little-known pharaoh Tutankhamun, or King Tut, who lived around 1400 BC and died when he was still a teenager. Backed by a rich Brit, Lord Carnarvon, Carter searched for five years without success. In early 1922, Lord Carnarvon wanted to call off the search, but Carter convinced him to hold on one more year. Finally, the wait paid off when Carter came upon the first of 12 steps of the entrance that led to the tomb of Tutankhamun. It was actually a local worker helping out in the excavations that stumbled upon a step and informed Carter. He quickly recovered the steps and sent a telegram to Carnarvon in England so they could open the tomb together. Carnarvon departed for Egypt immediately and on November 26, 1922, they made a hole in the entrance of the antechamber in order to look in. Carter recalled, At first I could see nothing. The hot air escaping from the chamber causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the lights, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues and gold, everywhere the glint of gold. When Carter and Lord Carnarvon entered the tomb's interior chambers on November 26, they were thrilled to find it virtually intact, with its treasures untouched after more than 3,000 years. The men began exploring the four rooms of the tomb, and on February 16, 1923, under the watchful eyes of a number of important officials, Carter opened the door to the last chamber. Just behind the blocking of the burial chamber's entrance in the tomb of Tutankhamun, Howard Carter and his assistants were met by what appeared to be a wall of gilded wood. What they were actually seeing was the outermost of a group of nested shrines that protected the king's sarcophagus. It was a carefully built construct, mostly built of cedar and held together by tenons of oak, Christ thorn wood and bronze. Within this shrine were contained a pole frame, a second, third and fourth inner shrine, and then the sarcophagus. Each shrine was constructed as a box, each one fitted at one end with double folding doors. The doors were held shut by ebony bolts sliding with massive silver-coated staples. Two other staples on each door were intended to receive a cord binding and seal. However, on the outermost shrine, neither the cord nor the sealing was present, though on the second and third shrines, these corded seals not only remained, but were intact. According to Howard Carter, We bumped our heads, nipped our fingers, we had to squeeze in and out like weasels and work in all kinds of embarrassing positions. The sarcophagus measured 2.7 meters long by 1.5 meters wide and 1.5 meters high. It was carved from a single block of the hardest quartzite and was supported at each corner upon a block of alabaster. According to archaeologist J. H. Priestead, when Carter and I opened the doors of the third and fourth shrines and beheld the massive stone sarcophagus within, I felt for the first time the majesty of the dead pharaoh's actual presence. The sarcophagus lid trembled, began to rise, Slowly and swaying uncertainly, it swung clear. What they found underneath two sheets of linen was a splendid human-shaped coffin. Its golden surface still shined brilliantly under Burton's arc lamps. However, the size and weight, about 1.36 metric tons or 3,000 pounds of this coffin, suggested that it was only the first of several such nested coffins. Within 
What was expected to be found was indeed found, a second human-shaped coffin. Once again, the surface was concealed beneath a decayed shroud of linen, which in turn was obscured by floral garlands and similar to the first coffin. There was a small wreath of olive leaves, blue lotus petals and cornflower wrapped around the protective deities of the pharaoh's brow. The second coffin was soon revealed as even more magnificent than the first. It measured two meters long and was constructed from wood, covered as before with an overlay of gold foil. It is hard to imagine the amount of work which must have been put into making this coffin. Carved in wood, it was overlaid with sheet of gold on the thin layer of gesso, a sort of plaster. Then narrow strips of gold, placed on edge, were soldered to the base to form cells in which the small pieces of colored glass, fixed with cement, were laid. After lifting the second coffin, the third coffin was revealed. Though covered once again with fine linen, it was tightly encased within the second coffin, and a shroud of red linen, folded three times, covered it from neck to feet. The face of this coffin had been left bare. The breast was adorned with a very delicate, broad color of blue glass beads and various leaves, flowers, berries and fruits. This third coffin was amazingly different, particularly in one respect, as Howard Carter notes. Mr. Burton at once made his photographic records. I then removed the floral collarettes and linen coverings. An astounding fact was disclosed. The third coffin was made of solid gold. The mystery of the enormous weight which had puzzled us was now clear. It explained also why the weight had diminished so slightly after the first coffin and the lid of the second coffin had been removed. Its weight was still as much as eight strong men could lift. The golden coffin measured about 1.9 meters in length. The metal was beaten from a heavy gold sheet and varies in thickness up to three centimeters. In 1929 it was weight, tipping the scales at 110 kilograms. <laughs>